Hi brothers and sisters, <clears throat> back for this study on Jeroboam. So, this is probably going to be a fairly long video, but I am going to have to omit chapters that's probably got a lot of detail in them. Um, but we'll begin in 1 uh, Kings chapter 11, which is one of the chapters that we actually used in um, <clears throat> the Key of David. So, 1 Kings 11, oh, where is it? It was just here. It's going to be difficult. And we'll begin at verse 9, um, so 1 Kings chapter 11. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, verse 10, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. Actually, what that meant was he was not to pursue other women outside of the nation of Israel. And that's exactly what Solomon did. Because in the day that you pursue these other women, they will turn you away from me, she says. And indeed they did. And they caused um, all the women, all the men in Israel to bow to Baal as Lord and God. And she warned the men in Israel that they could not take wives from the surrounding Adamic nations. We see them going against her over and over again. To which then in this chapter we see King Solomon actually daubing up the gates, or the breaches, the gateways, and uh, the wall of David his father, and it was to prevent the righteous daughters of Israel from flowing like a living water from Lebanon, or the house in the force of Lebanon, or from the North Kingdom, um, which is where your queen is found, uh, despite the fact that they changed altogether the female pronoun, removed the she completely from the context. Uh, because a, a harlot that will bow to Baal as God eventually uh, leads to the complete no one sees me part of the harlot spirit. Um, so it had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Verse 11, Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, my ten commandments, which I give through my daughters of Israel, representing me from above, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and I will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. So there's a reason why it is called the key of David, right? This is the reason why God did not rend the kingdom out of Solomon's hand. He waited for Rehoboam, and he did it for the sake of his father, David, because David loved her. He loved the glory of the true living God. He didn't hate her. And his gates was left open so that she could indeed flow like a living water. Now, how be it, I will not rend away all the kingdoms, but I will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. So we're, in a sense we're looking at the masculine, though in another sense we realize that it is the queen of lords, or the lord of lords, uh, the queen of kings that dwells in Jerusalem, though she flows from the house in the forest of Lebanon, your queen, like we said, was identified as coming from the tribe of Ephraim. Um, the scepter will not depart from Judah's feet until Shiloh comes, and to the one to whom it belongs to. And we're told who the one is that it belongs to uh, once we read some key passages, so maybe we'll get to that in a little bit or in another hour and a half or two. Um, so after the Lord stirred up the adversaries unto Solomon, okay, so we're going to skip through this part. We're going to keep going down here. So we just read uh, those few verses, and then we keep scrolling down here. We keep scrolling down, and we'll begin at verse 26. And we're going to bring Jeroboam in, and this is the son of Nebat, we're told. And um, he had great potential, he did. But when he saw... What Solomon was doing, which was denying his very own mother her rightful birthright, her house. He goes up to King Solomon and he confronts him. And we get this in verse 26. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zereda, Solomon's servant. So he was considered the servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruah. So we're bringing in his mother here for a particular reason. And we did all of that study in the Key of David and the passages that you need to use in order to understand what they were doing to the women of Israel. They were denying them in covenant, and they were taking harlots, who uh, the Babylonian uh, system 
um, that bow, the women were made to bow to the religious idol of Baal husband, which is another name for your husband, which is also akin to the calf idols that eventually came out of Egypt. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that as we go. So, he, whose mother's name was Zeru, a widow woman, and even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this is the reason, and this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king, Sol king Solomon, built Milo, and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. What we see as repairing is covering them over. He was daubing them up. And we see the, the, the allegory, too, even as Adam uh, hides iniquity in his bosom. He covers it over. He daubed it up. He daubed that up. He daubs a harlot up inside, which is exactly what King Solomon was doing. He was taking harlot wives from the surrounding Adamic nations to the point where he ends up with 700 wives, 300 concubines. He walls up the gateways that should have been rightfully, they were called um, the Zion's Gate, Daughter Zion's Gates, where, where gave those allegories or that understanding in Psalm uh, chapter 9, and it links you to Psalm 24, and we begin to understand it was the divine female that owned these gateways, and she should have been allowed to pass through as the living water, the flowing water, um, and we see Solomon daubing those up, tearing the houses down. Jeremiah 9 brings us to that conclusion. Isaiah 22 brings, brings us to that conclusion. Micah chapter 2 brings us to those conclusions. Once we are able to pull all of the, the, um, passages together that helps us to verify exactly what was going on against the daughters of Israel, the female scions that were going over um, the wall of David and Joseph's blessings in Genesis 49 verses 23 and 24 verifies that it was indeed their husband known as Baal, who was also known as Archer, who was shooting these lying words and denying the rightful spirit in covenant. And her rightful law was not upheld, which was shown in Deuteronomy 4 as the Ten Commandments. It's typically called a law, but then they get carried away by saying, Law is what shapes iniquity. The Ten Commandments of God would have been the law system for this world that we were founded upon. And uh, then they take it and they begin to add and add and add and add a very heavy yoke to these daughters' necks because they reject them in covenant. And we see what happened to that over time. So, um, and this was the cause he lifted up his hand against um, King Solomon. Now, this Milo does so have something to do with the palace. The house in the forest of Lebanon was a palace. This Milo has something to do with what he was doing to it. We get an inkling of what he was doing to it in Isaiah 22, as well as other passages that we have looked at. And repaired the breaches. He didn't repair nothing. He daubed them over. He prevented the righteous spirit access to her rightful place. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. So I said he made him ruler over um, the tribes of Israel. And what it says in one of these passageways, that was the eventuality of the whole thing. And I'm not so sure that Jeroboam played some dirt here. But we won't discuss it. We'll look at what the actual passages say. But I do believe that there had to be something more going on here. And it's like, you know, current political affairs when you watch a movie to do with politics and all the dirty strings that gets pulled that nobody sees, right? And this all has that idea behind when you get reading all these passages concerning Jeroboam, he certainly was looking to elevate him to a status that he had not proven himself worthy of. So, um, so Solomon here actually buys him off, but it wasn't to make him ruler. This is what gets to be so curious to me. Because it says this in a different passage, it says, uh, or the same passage with, with a different uh, interpretation. It says, now the man Jeroboam was capable, and Solomon noticed the young man because he was getting things done. So he appointed him over the entire, now pay attention to what it says here, labor force of the house of Joseph. So the house of Joseph had one of their own appointed over them, okay? We get this understanding in this passage. All right, so let's just hang on to that as we go. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shiloh nut, found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. Garment here is a female cloak. It is so the glory identified. 
I'm not so sure it wasn't a female prophetess sent by the Lord herself. Now, why would the Lord send Ahijah to um, Jeroboam at this point? All right? Now, I think there's, we just see why the Lord did it. All right? We read this, we get why the Lord was doing it. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and ran it in 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I am about to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand, and I will give you ten tribes. Now, why would the Lord do that? Because we were just told what Solomon was doing. He was taking wives from the surrounding Adamic nations, and he was daubing up the gateways. The rightful possessors of these gateways are identified as the daughters of Israel's gateways. They belong to her. They did not belong to the heart of the spirit that Solomon decided he was going to put in charge. And by putting the harlot in charge, that bag to Baal as Lord and God, he knew it was going to make him a great king. Why do you think he worshipped Moloch? These women did not turn his heart away. His heart was already turned away. He wanted to be a great king. So the daughter of Israel, identified as the Lord here, she sends her, one of her servants. Now they got it a male. I believe it quite likely could have been one of her very own daughters of Israel. Uh, a prophetess, and she sent to Jeroboam. And this is what she says to him, because she knew what Solomon was up to. And so she was looking for another uh, man that was like David. This is why it gets to be called the key of David. So, but one tribe will remain his because of my servant David. So David was her servant. And because of Jerusalem, the city I chose out of all the tribes of Israel. For they have abandoned me. They have bowed the knee to Ashtaroth. You see? What was there for her to love about man who was supposed to be in covenant with her as the righteous spirit and the ruler of the kingdom? And he was turning the hearts of the people to an idol, to an Ashtaroth, a female idol that would bow to these men, and then to men who wanted to rule and who were wicked and violent and Everything was about money, 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 and themselves, building themselves up much like Solomon was about. So, for they have abandoned me, and they have bowed the knee to Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, to Chemosh, the god of Moab, and to Milcom, yeah, Malcolm, derivative, um, Malik, um, Malik, king, the god of the Ammonites. They have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and to carry out my statutes and my judgments as his father David did. So we know David absolutely adored her. He says, let my eyes look upon the glory of the Lord. Um, let me dwell in the place, house of the Lord all the days of my life so that I might gaze upon his beauty. <laughs> oh, no sense in reasoning there. He loved her. That's why uh, she's called the key of David. And um, she was giving... Um, um, she was giving praise by calling it the key of David to David. So, however, I will not take the whole kingdom from his hand, but I will let him be ruler all the days of his life because of my servant David, not because of himself. He's not um, a righteous son. He's a wicked son. He has turned on my covenant. He has, he has daubed up the gates of David his father so that the key, the true key, my righteous daughters of Israel who serve me, who carries out my law, which is the Ten Commandments, and by extension we see part of how that uh, affects us as human beings in a good way in Isaiah 58, um, I, who, whom I chose and kept my commands and my statutes. So this is what she says to Jeroboam. I will take ten tribes of the kingdom from his son's hand and I will give them to you. I will give one tribe to his son so that my servant David will always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city I chose for myself to put my name there. So she's talking about the male that she chooses, right? I will appoint you and you will reign as king over all you want and you will be my king over Israel. But, after that, if you obey all I command you, and you walk in my ways, and you do what is right in my sight, and in order to keep my statutes and my commands as my servant David did, I will be with you, and I will build you a lasting dynasty just as I built for David, and I will give you Israel. So, we see all the reasons why she was prepared to do this. I will humble David's descendants because of their unfaithfulness 
but I'm not going to do it forever, she says. So what's unfaithfulness here? I never looked this up, but let's look at it. We were told that they were treacherous and they dealt treacherously, which is unfaithful, with the wife of the original covenant in Malachi chapter 2. And it does so um, allude to the fact that she's representing the spirit. But nobody wants to understand that. They don't care about that truth. All they care is that Baal or Jesus is God. That's it. Nothing else to it. So I will, because of... See, it's not there. Afflict. So they've removed that word completely right out of here. It's not there anywhere. 853 is the oath of the covenant. So you would, though they tell you it's untranslatable. But 853 le leads you right back to the word 226, which means an oath. 853 does so has something to do with the covenant of the oath of the original daughters of Israel. And I will afflict. Right? So 853, and I, because the words are rearranged, I don't know how it goes here. The descendants. Okay. So I do not see it there. So it may be in... Because, okay, so maybe it ain't there. Uh, I got the wrong verse on this. Let's go back. Okay, so it's verse 39. Let's go back. See what it says here. It's not moving. So verse 39. Yeah, see this version here. Um, it's the HCSB version. Says unfaithful. I tend to think they removed this word because that is the exact word that they use in more than two passages. Um, there's two that I can remember right off, and I know that there's others. Where they accuse Adam of being unfaithful and treacherous in the covenant with God, which was with the righteous daughters of Israel. And that we know that Adam uh, dealt treacherously, and that Judah dealt treacherously in the marriage covenant. We're told that again in Malachi 2, and that word treacherous, which is unfaithful there, when you're going to look it up, is so what is meant. So I tend to believe um, that they're getting their understanding from something that actually is being addressed in the passage. So Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam. And Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now, the rest of the events of Solomon. Okay, so we're going to move into First Kings chapter 12 and we're going to look at I don't know do I start in all of it um, uh, let's see do I got it okay so I got that passage pulled up in that one okay so let's begin reading in first Kings chapter 12 so so far we've been in chapter 11 and now we're moving to chapter 12 Okay, so chapter 12, where had I determined to start in chapter 12? Okay, <clears throat> so let's see where we're going to begin. So it's rebellion against Jeroboam, uh, rebellion against Rehoboam is where uh, it begins, okay? And we discussed why they were rebelling against him. So, and Rehoboam... Come on, go up. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, um, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. Now when Jeroboam son of Nebat heard about it, for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon's present, presence, Jeroboam stayed in Egypt. They summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. Your father made our yoke difficult. You, therefore... Lighten your father's harsh service and the heavy yoke he put on us and we will serve you. Now, that must have been after he fled because the workforce was put under his control, right? So, there's a question there. Because Solomon was intending to lighten it, now we know it was a buy-off. We do. And only when Solomon heard that Rehoboam was going to be made king over ten of the tribes in the northern kingdom, 
Um, did he then go into hiding in Egypt? Okay. So Rehoboam replied, go home for three days and then return to me. So the people left. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon when he was alive, asking, how do you advise me to respond to these people? And they replied, today, if you will be a servant to these people and serve them, and if you respond to them by speaking kind words to them, they will be your servants forever. But he didn't do that. We saw what he did, right? But he rejected the advice of the elders who advised him and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him and served him. And he advised, he asked them, what message do you advise that we send back to these people who said to me, listen, lighten the yoke your father put on us. Then the young men who had grown up with him told him, this is what you should say to them. People who said to, to these people who said to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. This is what you should tell them. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. So we got the allusion to, to it actually being directed at women, uh, which takes us a direct link to the key of David. They were exalting the key of Solomon, and this continues on through the son of Rehoboam, which is why the Lord pulls the kingdom uh, at least... Ten tribes away from Rehoboam. He wouldn't do. She wouldn't do it in the day um, of uh, David and Solomon. She promised David she wouldn't do it. Um, so because David upheld the key of David, the flowing waters of Lebanon in the law, the Ten Commandments. If you can't equate what I'm meaning when I'm saying the Ten Commandments to the law, well, whatever. Although my father burdened you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions or barbed whips. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had ordered, returned to me on the third day. Then the king answered the people harshly, and he rejected the advice the elders had given him, and spake to them according to the young men's advice. My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your, your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with barbed whips or with scorpions. The king did not listen to the people because this turn of events came from the Lord to carry out, not his words, hers. We've identified this Lord as she. And this continues to identify her as a feminine the deeper we get into the study of Jeroboam. So, which the Lord had spoken to Ahijah the Shilonet knight to Jeroboam, son of Nemat. Now, next section is called The Kingdom Divided. When all Israel saw that the king had not listened to them, the people answered him, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse, Israel. Return to your tents. David, now look after your own house. So Israel went to their tents. Now, you can see the feminine aspect in that. You can so. They were denied. They were denied their rightful place. Um, and, and the sons were taking full control, full charge of the flowing waters by shutting it off. And over time we see it becoming a blood covenant. But Rehoboam reigned over the Israelites living in the cities of Judah. And then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the forced labor. Okay, so it changes hands. We see that, okay, after Job, Jeroboam flees. But, but, but all Israel stoned him to death, and King Rehoboam managed to get into the chariot and flee to Jerusalem. So Israel is in rebellion against the house of David unto this day. They just don't have a full comprehension of why they are so when all Israel heard that jo Jeroboam had came back, they summoned him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. No one followed the house of David except the tribe of Judah alone. Now, when Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mobilized 180,000 choice warriors from the entire house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to, to Rehoboam, son of Solomon. But a revelation from God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, to the whole house of Judah and Benjamin and to the rest of the people. This is what the Lord says, you are not to march up and fight against your, it says your brothers, but it was the sisters that they were really turning on at this point. 
which is why Solomon dubbed up the gates, which were called the gates of the daughters of Zion. It belonged to them. That's why it's a feminine. When you look at Psalm 9 and Psalm 24, you will get your understanding. Each of you must return home, for I have done this. So they listened to what the Lord said and went back, as she had told them. So Rehoboam does something really weird here. He actually listens to the Lord. Wow. Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And from there he went out and built Penuel. So Jeroboam said to himself, the way things are going now, watch, the kingdom might return to the house of David. So here we see Jeroboam, the wickedness in his heart starting to work. If these people regularly go to offer, get what he says here, sacrifices. This is a key word to understand what the festival actually was about at this point in Judah. It doesn't matter the month different. What matters is the festival and what was going on there. All right? It's the same festival today. So we're looking at sacrifice. The word sacrifice is important. So if this people go up to do sacrifice, let's look the word up and see if it's got to do with blood. Because understand, not all words do have to do with blood. Sacrifices. This is Strong's Hebrew 2077. A sacrifice. Offering. A slaughter. Sacrificial. So we're looking at a blood offering, properly a slaughter, the flesh of an animal, by implication a sacrifice, the victim of the act, offering a sacrifice. So properly a slaughter. All right. So we are so looking at a blood, a blood sacrifice here. Now that's important because that blood sacrifice to a bull is what came out of Egypt. It did not come from God. God says, I ask no blood of you. Why is that important? Because of what we're going to learn following this. We need to establish actually what the festival was being celebrated in Judah at this point, point in time. Um, to understand how this is so relevant um, to the study and how um, the religion in Egypt followed the children out and they began to sacrifice in Judah and then Jeroboam tells us uh, many details about it and why the people were willing to accept this alright because they had already accepted it in Judah due to the fact that King Solomon and men like him had already began their turning away from the daughters of Israel which were identified as the glory of um, uh, Israel it was feminine, and it says in Psalm 106, and we'll get to that too, that they changed the glory to a bull. So it's important to establish what they mean here by sacrifice, and that was the sacrifice. And Jeroboam confirms it by what he does here, and the people willingly receive it, because it was the exact same mimic of what was going on in Judah. Now it says of his own heart. But the people would not have received this if it was not the same ceremony going on in Judah, though it was a month later. So Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. For there he went out and built Penuel. Jeroboam said to himself, the way things are going now, the kingdom might return back to the house of David. If these people regularly go to offer sacrifices, so it's a blood offering, in the Lord's temple in Jerusalem, the heart of these people will return to their Lord. So to their Lord here is 113. All right. You understand this is a human Lord. They're calling him Lord, which is 113. It's the same number of your high priest number 113 sitting on a throne in Psalm 110. It's the same number, Lord, 113. And they're just giving it to a plain old man here, Rehoboam. So these people will return to their Lord, 113. Rehoboam, king, 
of Judah. So the high priest, like I said in Psalm 110, his number is 113. Yeah. It's, it's a mere mortal. Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will murder me and go back to the king of Judah. So, the king sought advice. And then he made, what did he make? Two golden calves. And he said to the people, Going to Jerusalem is too difficult for you. Israel, here is your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Who was that God? Who was that God that brought them up out of the land of Egypt? Where is it here? Can I find it? Okay, Jude, and there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. It says, For certain men have crept in among you unnoticed, ungodly ones who were designed long ago for condemnation. These were the ones that were turning, and they did it in the Old Testament, and are doing it in the New to build up an idol called Jesus, who is truly Baal. And this is who they're going to tell you led them. All right? Um, who were designed, designated long ago for condemnation. They turned the grace of our God into a license for immorality. And they deny our only master. It should have been the daughter Israel. And they got, and your Lord Jesus Christ. Although you are fully aware of this, I want to remind you that after Jesus had delivered his people out of the land of Egypt, he destroyed those who did not believe. So we are so getting an idol of a bull here. Jesus, who saved you out of Egypt, right? Who led you out of Egypt. So it is so leading us back to what Jeroboam was actually creating here. He was creating a religious system in the, in the land. And it had already begun through wicked kings like Solomon. Okay, so back to, is that where I was? Twelve. There, there we go. So Jeroboam said to himself, the way things are going, they'll return. Okay. Um, so the king sought the advice, and then he made two golden calves. Now, the minute I saw two golden calves, my first thought was uh, the cherubims. That was my first thought. And there's two cherubims, one on each side on the Ark of the Covenant, right? And they also stood guard, apparently, in the temple is what many of the pictures will show. Now, while the new cherubs, modern cherub, modern day cherubs that they'll show in Israel or Jerusalem that they made is one male, one female, they speculate that these may have been cherubims made in the image of calves, both male, by the way. And he said to the people going to Jerusalem, it's too difficult for you, so Israel, here is your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, why would the people succumb to this worship if it wasn't something that was already known in Judah? And we know that it was because of that little word, sacrifice. They were so offering a blood sacrifice, a bull offering. And that religious lie is what came out of Egypt. How do we know that? Because of what is right here, mentioned in Exodus 30. Two, and First Kings chapter 12, which is where we are. In the Old Testament, worship of the golden calf is seen as a supreme act of apostasy. And indeed it was. The rejection of a faith, faith once confessed, a covenant once confessed, that they would remain true to the daughter of Israel's covenant, which was the covenant of the Ten Commandments, and not write your own religious lies and laws and force her down at your feet, which is what they did. The figure is probably a representation of the Egyptian bull god Apis, Egyptian bull god Apis, in the earlier period, and of the Canaanite fertility god Baal in the latter. And we will see how it exactly follows that procession as we follow Jeroboam and all the successive kingdoms slowly coming and building on that idol to the point where it is so bare an image standing of a man as your Lord and God in your great sacrifice, which began as a bull, Apis, out of Egypt.
Then we see him doing this in 1 Kings chapter 12. And you're telling me we're not under a religious law? That the men on the pulpit can't be bothered to go in and study and trace down and track down? They're not going to do it. And it was designed that way because what they're being taught, he, 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 they love it. It is honey on their tongue, it tickles their ears, but it is going to kill you in the end. There is no life in that. So, watch. Watch what we... And so, we'll go in on the commentary. That's what I wanted to do. So, when you go up... Let me see. I got the right passage here. So, I want the commentary on verse 28. So, here's what it says. In a commentary. <clears throat> and I'm going to read it all. And I'll leave the link down below. I said I'm going to read it all, if it'll scroll down. I'm going to read the first, um, maybe two paragraphs. So calves of gold, and these are masculine when you go in and you look it up. The choice of this symbol of the divine nature, turning, as the psalmist says, with indignant scorn, the glory of God into the similitude of a calf that eateth hay. Now that's found in Psalm 106 verse 20. That's right, where they changed their glory from the daughters of Israel, which all was identified. Anybody with half a brain can identify that when they go in and determine to actually study truth instead of a lie. But this world can't receive uh, the truth. I can tell you one thing, it may not matter in this life, but it's darn well going to matter in the next. Um, was probably due to a combination of causes. First, the very repetition of Aaron's words in Exodus 32 verse 8 indicates that it was a revival of the ancient idolatry in the wilderness. Probably, like it, it was suggested by the animal worship of Egypt, with which Jeroboam had been recently familiar, and which all of the Israelites were familiar with, and which, as is well known, varied from mere symbolism to gross creature worship. Next, the bull as the emblem of Ephraim. It wasn't a bull, it was a heifer that symbolized her. They changed it to a bull. Uh, actually, the heifer came to symbolize her as this takes hold as um, an animal type uh, religion. But now we got to break the allegory down of it all. Because they thought by shifting uh, truth for allegory that you would never find it once they began uh, teaching that idol Baal standing Jesus as God, that you would never be able to go back in and see what they had done to bring that about. Um, so the emblem of Ephraim would naturally become a religious connaissance of the new kingdom. Yeah, it is. Lastly, there is some reason to believe that the figure of the cherubim uh, was that of a winged bull. Well, of course, yes, what else would it be? And the form of the ox was undoubtedly used in the temple as, for example, under the brazen sea or brazen sea. It had been thought that the calves were reproductions of the sacred cherubim, made, however, symbols not of the natural powers obeying the divine word, but of the deity itself. Uh, it was permitted because they were turning away from her covenant. So she says, fine, you want this, you'll have it. And you're going to find out what your latter end is going to be. Then you're not going to be able to save yourselves in a religious lie. Um, so we see all of this. And why is this understanding here on your commentary to the bottom of your page when you go in on the interlinear for verse 28, 1 Kings chapter 12. And you scroll to the bottom. It's going to say calves of gold. Now I'll leave the link. But this is what it says in the New Testament. If you're paying attention, Hebrews chapter 9. So neither by the blood of bulls, of goats, and calves, but by his blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Oh, did he? For if the blood of bulls and of goats. Now, understand what it's telling us here. And the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified through the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, now they're talking a man here, an idol, who through the eternal spirit, which was just shown you as a heifer sprinkling the unclean. So they changed her glory over to a bull, is what they did. 
God says, I never require a blood sacrifice of you ever. I ask nothing but for you to uphold my Ten Commandments. And you couldn't do it. You turned on me. And you took harlot that would bow to you as if you were God in the earth. And you cast me aside, the spirit of the true living God. This is what you did. So, there we have it in the New Testament. Our religion has held from Egypt. It has passed through the generations. Let's keep reading. In 1 Kings chapter 12. We'll keep reading and see what else we understand here. It'll go back. Okay, so here he's, he's given all power to these calves, which eventually becomes a calf that brought them out of Egypt, and we see that testified to in Jude 1. So he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan, and this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, <coughs> even unto Dan. So Jeroboam also built shrines on the high places and set up priests from every class of people who were not Levites. This takes us back to Malachi 2. Now, do I have Malachi 2 pulled up? I do. This is what it says. Okay. Now, let's finish reading in 1 Kings so we get the understanding of what is, what is actually in view in Malachi. Okay? So he set up pre priests. Um, from every class of people who were not Levites, Jeroboam made a festival in the eighth month of the fifteenth day of the month, like the festival in Judah. So it says it's like the festival in Judah, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. He made this offering in Bethel to sacrifice to the calves he had set up. He also stationed the priests in Bethel for the high places he had set up. He offered sacrifices on the altar he had set up in Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month, and he chose this month on his own. He made a festival for the Israelites, offering up sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. So they say, oh, what a heathen concept this is. There is virtually no difference between this concept and the one that they set up on the 7th. And this is what we'll read about um, Sukkot. All right? Because this is what he was trying to parallel. Uh, where is it? Can I find it here? No, nope, it's not that one. Oh, is it here? Right there. I'm pretty sure it's here. Let me see if I can find it. No, it's, um, is it here? I'll find it. It's just what they've got to say here. <clears throat> so the Feast of Tabernacles. Sukkot recalls the journey of the Jews from Egypt to the Promised Land when they lived in a temporary booth called a sukkah. The harvest season is symbolized by the lulav, the palm branch, the etrog, that's the citron, the myrtle, and the willow, which are used together during the synagogue. Now, this is what he was, what they're saying, he mimicked by this, um, setting this up. But this is also what it says of Sukkot, for anybody who knows the Feast of Tabernacles, and says these feasts are important to our understanding, that they weren't just made up right out of the cloth. Oh, yes, they were. Do your study in the Old Testament and try to reason it out. But this is what it says on Wikipedia. Over time, the festival was historicized by symbolic connection with the desert sojourn of Exodus. That's in Leviticus 23, verse 42 to 43. However, it has been noted by both ancient and modern scholars that the narrative of the Exodus tract never placed the Israelites in booths. Never. So, we have feasts coming out of nowhere. Made right up. Religious lies. So, from 12, we're going to track on to, let me see here. We're going to go to Malachi. 
And this has to do with the priests that were being set up. And we bring in the word dung here clearly, identifying, whether you know it or not, the idol of Baal. Baal was called the Lord of Dung. And Baal, the Lord of Dung, was the same as Baal, B-A-A-L, little Baal, as your husband, as Lord and God. There was no difference between these two numbers in meaning. Um, so, this is why the Lord brings in dung multiple times. She's trying to show you something. So, verse 1, Malachi chapter 2. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse unto you, and I will curse your blessing. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to your heart. They're so ignorant now of everything that's took place that they believe in this lie so wholeheartedly. There's no bringing them back from it in many indications of the Old Testament. They fell into the snare that they laid for us to fall into and they do not escape. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and I will spread dung upon your faces. You get that? Even the dung of your solemn feast. You get the dung we're talking about here? Do you not understand the idol standing in Daniel 2 is the exact same idol we're worshipping today as our bridegroom, Lord and Master, who dripped blood into a peaceful covenant that they did not want. And that idol standing is Baal, another name for your husband, and is called Lord of Dung. So even the dung of your solemn feast which begin with those uh, cat, that calf idol out of Egypt. Um, and one shall take you away with it, and ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my servant might be with Levi, that my covenant might be with Levi, say the Lord of hosts. Now Levi becomes very important here. Once we understand what Levi did in um, the wanderings, when the Israelites began to bow down and worship the idol of the calf. This becomes pertinent to our understanding. They were the only tribe willing to go out and cut away the men because it was clearly shown that it was the men who wanted the idol made. It was not the daughters. The daughters did not want this idol made. It was the men who wanted this idol made. They wanted flesh in their baskets and in their mouth. And they complained, well, when we were in Egypt, you see, and we still got it going on today, the exact same religion, but now it's a pious and righteous, it's not a blood, it's a good covenant. Yeah, as long as you don't go in and do any study, just have blind faith in a lie. It'll save you, don't worry. So, and ye shall know that I have sent this commandment, because my covenant was with Levi. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me, and was afraid before my name. So Levi was one of the few tribes, he was the only tribe at this point, that actually went in and took, cut away the foreskin. Is actually what we're looking at. And said, no, you're not of God, you don't belong to the daughters of Israel. They won't tell you that, but that's exactly what it's alluding to. Levi, <coughs> along with um, oh, what was Simon, uh, were the only two also that were, were very angry on behalf of their sister Dinah, who was murdered uh, out in the lands of the Gentiles. <coughs> and so these two sons, Levi and Simon, took it upon themselves to deal with what these, uh, this son, in, one son in particular, had done to their sister Dinah. Uh, so there was some good to be found in these men, for sure. Uh, Levi especially, because he continued to show himself over and over that he definitely was so in covenant with the true living Spirit of God, and that was the daughters of Israel, who was uh, a direct um, descendant of their mother God from above. So her covenant was, was that with them. The law of truth was in his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity. Oh, there we go with that word equity that nobody likes. And did turn many away from iniquity. 
For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at Levi's mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way, ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. What do you think the Torah is if it isn't a corruption? It's a corruption. The Ten Commandments come from the daughter of Israel's mouth made in her mother's image from above. And God says, God mother says, when you rejected her, you rejected me in covenant. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. We see where the partiality begins to come in, saying that the women are not equal to the men, and they begin to burden them and burden them and burden them down with a very heavy yoke of the law system upon their neck, telling them that they're not people under the law. It actually is akin to the tearing down of the house and the force of Lebanon where the government of God met. That's right. And they brought out righteous rulings and made just, um, the land is what they were responsible for doing. And when you see Solomon daubing up the gates or the breaches in David's wall, he's shutting it off to them. And by extension, he takes control of the house and the force of Lebanon, which is then why you see the king that is wiser than anyone. That's how it's spoken in um, Ezekiel 28 and it's talking about Solomon. That's why it's saying thou art wiser than Daniel The only one wiser in the scriptures that we know of is King Solomon It's addressing King Solomon who took control of Tyre Which was where the house and the force of Lebanon would have been and so what we also further extrapolate from the information gave to us in Ezekiel 28 is that it cannot be talking about his father in the context of of the next passage when Solomon in the first passage is addressed as a prince. In the next passage it's saying it's addressing a king. I don't think so. That king would have had to have been King David and it definitely was not King David. I speculate that it was his mother. That's what I speculated and if you want to know what I speculate you'll have to pull the video up. So <coughs> Judah had dealt treacherously. So have we not all one father? No, it's a mother. One mother we have. It's the X that's in every one of our chromosomes. In our our chromosomes, that's right. The X X X Y X X. Have we not all one mother? <laughs> Had not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously? There it is. Unfaithfully. Every man against his, not his brother. If we continue to read, it's clear it was their sisters that they were dealing treacherously with. The wife of the original covenant. Because they didn't want to receive the Ten Commandments at her, law, at her mouth. Oh my gosh, no, I'm not going to do that. So, <clears throat> why do we deal treacherously every man against his sister? By profaning the covenant of our mothers is what they did. Judah has dealt treacherously, unfaithfully. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord which she loved. And had married the daughter of a strange God. The one that would bow to him as Lord and God. That's right. They didn't want the true covenant which was with the righteous daughters of Israel who didn't bow. <laughs> they were face to face. Equity and equal under the law. Yeah, muscles don't make you God. It was never muscles in an image. It was the spirit. But we also get her uh, allegorical rise here as the spirit upon the earth. Um, so she's reflecting her mother in the Godhead. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this and the master and the scholar out of the tabernacles of Israel, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, with crying out. I heard this every Sunday, the last place I was to. This is all they did, and it was nothing more than to blow up an image of a man. Bail. Oh, weep and sore. You just don't know what he's done for you. You just don't get it. 
Yeah, do you get what she's done for you? No, who cares? Big deal. And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that she regardeth not your offering any more. It's no longer true. You weep and cry over yourself. That's what you do it for. You don't do it for any other reason. Um, so she don't regard your offering anymore or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet you say, Wherefore? Why don't you? Why aren't you hearing us? For what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have acted treacherously against her, unfaithfully. Though she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant, the other half of your covenant, you didn't want her because you couldn't stand to uphold ten commandments that was gave at her mouth that made you everyone equal. You couldn't stomach it. So then we have Jeroboam turning against that covenant by putting in false uh, high priests or priests <coughs> that will continue to add and, and um, take out and, and deal partially with women. They don't speak the truth in the law. They simply take over writing it, which then becomes the false foundation that this entire world is founded upon. So they say, why? Uh, because the Lord says, I have been witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have acted treacherously against her, though she was your marriage partner, and the other half of your covenant is what it should say. Didn't the one God make us with a remnant of her life breath? And what does the one seek? You know what she seeks? A godly offspring. Godly children. And what does the Shulamite say? Yet my own vineyard have I not kept. I've been too busy keeping bales. Oh, it's father's children. No, they're not. They were always supposed to be mother's children. And she was doing what? She was seeking for godly children. A godly offspring. So watch yourselves carefully. And do not act unfaithfully against the wife of your youth. Who you consistently want to say, No, there's no such thing as she. The she pronoun ain't in there anywhere. And you know why? Because Baal removed it and dealt treacherously against the wife of his youth. This is what this testifies against. If she hates, if he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice. You want to know why your garment is akin to a web of lies? In Isaiah 59, go read it, which cannot hold together because violence was in their hand. Treachery was in their hand. Partiality was in their hand. They couldn't write the truth because they were not the priests in covenant with the living God, which were the Levites. Jeroboam put in different lines. <coughs> so, therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you ask, How have we wearied not him, her? When you say, Everyone who does what is evil is good in the Lord's sight, so current day religion is taught as being Good to go against your wife. Sit down and shut up, woman. You're under me. You're supposed to listen to me. That's what God said. Yet everyone who do, does right what, what is evil, everyone who does what is evil and good is good in the Lord's sight. And he, she, is pleased with them. Where or where is the God of justice? Well, she turned away to prove to you what your ladder in would be when you reject her righteous daughters and covenants. That gets eaten the land. Now. Okay. Oh, getting tired. So, we're going to begin now in 1 Kings 14. Now, where do I want to start here? We'll start in verse 1, <coughs> just to make sure that we don't forget anything. <clears throat> My voice is getting tired. At that time, Abijah, so this was that, that pro, okay. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. So now why is that Abijah? Was that not the same name as the Shilonite? Let's go see here. 
where's the 11? There it is. Let's go up. The Shiloh Knight. Where is it? I keep going up here. This is important. Why are they, why is it, okay, it's a hija. Okay. So, that was the name of the prophet that came to Jeroboam and told him the things that the Lord had said. His son's name is <clears throat> uh, Abijah, right? So you got Ahija and Abijah. So, where's first king, where's kings, first kings 14? Oh, don't tell me, it just took it away. It did, it took it away. No, there it is. Okay, so at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. All right, and he says to his wife, um, you know, hide yourself and go up. Okay, and there is Ahijah, <coughs> the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people and take with thee ten loaves. So she goes, okay, and Ahijah says, oh, you're playing dirty, you're covering yourself. We, we love to write these things. Um, so behold, the wife Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shall thou say unto her, for it shall be when she cometh that she shall feign herself to be another woman. <clears throat> Which was um, Jeroboam's idea. And it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet, and she came in all at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam, why feignest thou thyself to be another, for I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Go tell Jeroboam. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So maybe this is key. Don't always listen. Don't listen to your husband. <clears throat> so why are you feignest to be another? Well, it was told by Jeroboam. I'm pretty sure it says this here. For her to cover herself in height and let it not be known who she is. So go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee, and yet that has not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, my ten commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam, and I will cut off, <clears throat> there's that key word, cut off, that's why you cut the foreskin off, and I will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisses against the wall. So, not going after the women, we're going after the men. That's what we're going after. And we'll cut off from Jeroboam him that pisses against the wall. So it's a clear identification of who's being targeted. The men who are turning on the covenant. And him that is shut up and left in Israel. And we'll take away the remnant. And for those who have precious ears and can't hear the word pisses. What do you read? What do you hear in your crime rates going on every friggin' day of your life? But we're too precious to hear that word pisses or the other word S-H-I-T. Oh my gosh, I'm too pure to hear those two words. They're right in your own Bible. Um, go read. But we're too precious and innocent to hear those. And yet you've got no problem looking at the crime rate of rape, of murder, and of human trafficking. Don't bother your conscience at all, but that nasty word pisses against the wall. I'm sure it's going to cause you to shut off the video because you're just that innocent. <laughs> and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away. What? Dung. Till it be all gone. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city. Now pay attention here because we've got dung. It was all about... Jeroboam want to be worshipped. Oh, sure it was. It absolutely was. But watch what happens to his line because of it. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city, pay attention, shall the dogs eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord has spoken it. So, here we get Baal in view. Yeah, watch how it's going to flow. He made the idol of the calf, which he knew well from Egypt, as did every Israelite. They knew this calf idol. They did so. 
and it remained in existence till it took shape in the form of a man as your offering and sacrifice that would die to cleanse you with his blood. So, and that's Baal standing. Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. And all Israel will mourn for him, and they will bury him for the only, uh, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. <coughs> so, moreover, that's an interesting verse. That might be worthy of a second look. Verse 13. Um, moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king, raise her up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what? It's even now happening. The Lord will raise up for herself a king over Israel. But she's also... Actually, it's not a king. It's a queen that she raises up. And if we get it right in, I believe it's Zechariah, it says the high, the rulership will be between the queen, they got a king, between the queen and the high priest. That's what the rulership is between. Which is why you'll get, um, I forget the passage now, but it's in the New Testament concerning, no you're not, ye are all uh, kings and high priests. No you're not, you're queens, you're queens. Your queens and priests is what you are. Once you get the understanding what Baal did to the real covenant of God. So, um, I'm not so sure this is correct, correct. But we know that over time kings do get raised up. Um, but we are also told that Pat, that 136 is over 113. So you have a queen over king. Is, is the understanding. Because 136 is daughter Israel's number. 113 is the high priest's number. We get that understanding in Psalm 110 as the three lords is mentioned there. 3068 is mother um, God's number from above. And all Israel shall mourn for her, okay? Moreover, the Lord shall raise uh, her up a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. Who will eliminate the house of Jeroboam? This is the day, yes, even today. She, she did it even that day. For the Lord will strike Israel and the people will shake as a reed shakes in water. She will uproot Israel from this good soil that she gave to their ancestors. And she will scatter them beyond the Euphrates. Okay, so we want to go down here to... We will go to... So now uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, reigned in Judah. This is verse 21. Uh, Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began, became king, and he reigned for 17 years in Jerusalem, the city where Yahweh had chosen from all the tribes of Israel to put her name. Well, it wasn't. It, it was She chose a son out of here. Her firstborn is identified as Ephraim. And so if you put your context correctly, then the Yahweh that's speaking is uh, the feminine is what's speaking here. Um, then Rehoboam's mother's name was Naamah, the Ammonite. Judah did what was evil in the Lord's eyes. They provoked her to jealous anger more than all their ancestors had done with the sins that they committed. They also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars. There we go with the sacred pillars. The sacred pillars began as harlots, identified as the poles of Ashtaroth. Now we know this to be feminine pillars to be feminine here because uh, that your daughters may grow up as pillars polished after the similitude of a palace and we know that the only pillar ever placed upon a grave was on Rachel's so we see this as um, a representation of the female so they also built for themselves high places sacred pillars and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every green tree. So here we have the harlot really coming into focus that over the eventuality of time will completely bow to man as if he is Lord and God. There were even male cults, even male cults, prostitutes in the land. They imitated all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had disposed, dispossessed before the Israelites. So in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, went to war against 
uh, Jerusalem. He seizes the treasures. Um, he took all the gold shields that Solomon had made. King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them into the care of the captains of the royal escorts who guarded the entrance to the king's palace. Um, and so whenever the king entered the Lord's temple, the royal escorts would carry the shields and then they would take them back to the royal escorts armory. So the rest of the events of Rehoboam's reign and whatnot. So we get a continued carrying on, okay? Then we move into 1 Kings. First Kings chapter 16. All right. This gets to be very important because we're following the trend from generation to generation and we're extrapolating what actually happened in the beginning from generation to generation to the very end. And the Lord says to that, um, Isaiah 44 verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the Queen, not a king, and Redeemer of Israel, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. She's the rock, she says. I am the first and the last. There is no God but me. She states that in Deuteronomy 32. And you forgot the rock that writhed in pain to form you and birth you. I formed you in my room. I birthed you. I writhed in pain to bring you forth. <coughs> and she says, I am the first and I am the last. So you come from the roots of your mother. Um, and you will be the scepter at the top, is what it's saying. I'm the first and last. There is no God but me. Who then is like me? That's what this question becomes in Isaiah 44, verse 7. Who is like me? Guess what that means? Mikael. She who is like God. Who is like, who then is like me? She is like her. Israel, the daughters of Israel, is like her. They're holding her covenant on their tongue once again in the land. That's the Ten Commandments. Um, uh, her, uh, let her declare her case. So she says, who then is like me? Let her declare her case before me. Since I established an ancient people, let her foretell, foretell the things to come and what is to take place. Do not tremble or fear. Have I not told you and declared it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God but me? There is no other rock that I know of, she says. You forgot about me. Yeah, you didn't want me in covenant. She says, I know not one. Psalm 74, 22. Arise, O God. Plead thine own cause, your own case, your own controversy. Remember the insults that the men and the fools bring against you daily. They accuse us daily. Isaiah 63, 11. Then she remembered. That word is special to me, remember, because in Strong's Greek, it's 34, 15. The days of old. So, then she remembered the days of old. And it says, Moses and her people saying, Where is she that brought them through the sea with the shepherdess of her flock or shepherd of her flock? Where is she who set her Holy Spirit among them? Verse 12, She sent her glorious right arm to be at Moses' right hand, dividing the waters before them to obtain eternal fame. What was the parting of the Red Sea akin to? A birthing process. <clears throat> and only the Holy One of Israel can do that because she is actually separating the blood from the water. It's two covenants, an admixture of doctrine, and it becomes allegorical to a wine that you are drunk on. <clears throat> so that takes us to Zechariah 3.18. So we'll begin reading in 1 Kings 16. Those are absolutely important passages to understand that if the daughters don't stand up and defend themselves, the sons will continue to accuse, 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 and will continue to get away um, doing uh, what they think is right under the law. Um, it says, does anyone call for justice in the land? So when she stands up for her children, it is akin to her standing up 
for her children. Me, Kael, she is standing up for her children once again. Or her, even her daughters. Now watch this as we see um, it go from generation to generation to generation. And we never see a change of this. We see an evolution of the religion is what we really see. Um, so, then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, For as much as I exalted thee out of the dust, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and thou hast walked in the way of who? Jeroboam, and has made my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. Behold, I will take away the posterity of Baasha and the posterity of his house, and I will make thy house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Him that dieth of Baasha in the city shall the dogs eat. We keep coming up with the dogs are going to eat you. And him that dieth of his in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. So we see um, the feast in some manner of the Lord. The feast of the Lord, the feast of daughter Israel, <coughs> that she gives to all that her mother created because she's actually made in her mother's image, though it was mother standing in the beginning. So when you see her standing and taking back her birthright, everything that belongs to her as that mighty angel in Revelation chapter 10 that they want to use that he pronoun on, it's actually she who is reborn of the dust of the earth now, swearing by her mother from above who lives forever. You see, she's swearing by her mother. Um, so now the rest of the acts of Baasha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Baasha slept with his fathers and was, was buried in uh, Terza, and Elah his son reigned in his stead. And also by the hand of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, came the word of the Lord against Baasha and against his house, even for all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, in provoking her to anger with the works of his hand, in being like the house of Jeroboam, and because he killed him, or had struck down the house of Jeroboam. In the twenty and six years of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel in Terza two years. And his servant Zimri, captain of half of his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Terza, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Terza. And Zimri went in and smote him and killed him in the twenty and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his stead. And it came to pass, when he began to reign, as soon as he sat on his throne, that he slew all the house of Baasa, or Baasha, and he left him not one that pisses against the wall, neither of his kinfolk nor of his friends. So now we're going to see a transitioning here from all the males. Now it's going to transition to the females included here in a minute. But I want to do one thing. We're going to use verse 11 to do it. I want to see the meaning of Baasha's Baasha name. I did this in a prior study, but I can't remember it. Um... I don't know that it's going to give me the meaning of his name. From an unused root, meaning to stink. Offensiveness. <laughs> so there we go back to the Lord of Dung. You see, you're getting it right in the meaning of the names if you're smart enough to look them up. Um, this is the pure language restored back to the people. It is the language of allegory. That's what it is. Where you're going to find your truth of what was going on. Um, so it came to pass... When he began to reign, as soon as he sat on his throne, that he slew all the house of Baasha. He left him not one that pisses against the wall, neither of his kinsfolk nor of his friends. Thus did Zimri destroy all the house of Baasha, according to the word of the Lord, which uh, she spake against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. So for all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son by which they sinned and by which they made Israel to sin in provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now we're going to see a transition here, like I said. Now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Now down we go. Um... <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to see what happens to Zimri here. Um, and it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken, uh, that he went into the palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire, and he died. So we see Zimri dying there. 
for his sins which he sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in walking in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, which he did to make Israel to sin. So I wonder what the name, what his name means, Zimri. Let's see if it gives Zimri. Usually it tells quite a bit in the name itself what they uh, were. So 7174, it says four Israelites went by this name. Uh, it means musical. So Zamar, it's from Zamar, to make music in praise of God. Well, they weren't making praise in God to the true living God. They were making praise to their idols. So now we see them taking up praise to the idols. Where they're singing song. We saw them offering up sacrifices to the idols of the calves in uh, what Jeroboam did when he made them. Um, okay, so down we go. Then were the people of Israel divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Genath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people that followed Omri prevailed against the people that followed Tibni, the son of Genath. So Tibni died, and Omri reigned. In the thirty and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel. Twelve years, six years, reigned he in Terza, And he bought the hill of Samaria, of Shemar, for two talents of silver, and built on the hill, and called the name of the city which he built, after the name of Shemar, owner of the hill, Samaria. But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did worse than all that was before him. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sons wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Omri which he did, and his might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab, oh, here we come to Ahab, his son reigned in, reigned in his stead. Why is Ahab? Because now we're going to get the transfer of the worship over to daughters. And them suffering the exact same death as those that pissed against the wall. All right? So we see a complete contamination going on. And in the 30 and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel and Samaria 20 and 2 years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were with him. Now, verse 31. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel. Baal, B-A-A-L, E-T-H-B-A-A-L. So we're getting the understanding, husband as Lord and God. She came from this kingdom that bowed down. <coughs> and we see now, Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Baal is another word for your husband as Lord and God. So we do so see the transference of it from the bull god Apis to a man standing as your sacrifice. Do we not see that? That's why Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of a golden statue or a, a kingdom. It was a male standing, but it was of different uh, values of metal and we see a rock cut out that's the spirit of the daughters of Israel being born upon you smashing the toes on the false image of uh, an idol of a man as your Lord and God in the earth and the Old Testament all testifies that this went on and on and on and on and on again and the men of Israel with the Torah fed a religious lie out to the world which becomes a false foundation which is known as a harlot spirit, a, ha har a false foundation, because the true foundation is still there for the building to be done. But they laid a false foundation so that they could build a religious law and law system upon that would yoke you women under him and place you right down in the dirt like a doormat. And it says you have laid your back flat for them to walk upon. Because he said bow down that we may walk upon you. And who do you think bowed down and they walked upon? Well they finally contaminated the woman's seed. And 
the, they become the true daughters of Israel becomes the outcasts that no man sought a covenant with. And they truly were the blood sacrifice in the earth. They died holding mother's covenant upon their tongue. In a variety of ways we are told. And that is also why the red heifer is burned to ashes. And he reared up an altar. Um, and it came to pass. We'll, we'll do it again. As if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal, in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Now, Baal, you can say Baal, or Baal, uh, Baal boweth down, Nebu, stupid. But they have gone into captivity themselves and cannot deliver the burden. Jeremiah 30, verse 6. Why now do I see every man standing around with his hands on his hips as a woman in travail and every face turned pale? I wonder if that isn't um, the hamstring in some way. But I also wonder if his gateway ain't closing up on him. And um, <laughs> some of the movies indicate that as the devil's anus. Uh, which we know it, the word devil... Links us to Baal, to Beelzebub, to Satan, and right back to Adam, the accuser. So perhaps that's why they're standing around with their hands on their hips. Their gateway is closing up on them. Um, <laughs> which is why the world is full of dung. And which is why the Lord uses that allegory over and over and over again. So, and... Verse 32, we'll read again. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Verse 33, and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. And in his days did Hiel the Bethelite built Jericho. He laid the foundations thereof in Abram his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segub. So we see him going, the firstborn of his womb, or not his womb, but of his loins, is his son. Yeah. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, why this gets to be important is because of the manner in which Jezebel dies. Now, let me see. I ain't got this pulled up, but let me see if we can find it. See if we can locate this passage. So it's saying First Kings twenty one. Uh, say to him, this is what the Lord says, have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Well, they murdered women and they did this over and over again. Nobody had an issue with it. Uh, but um, God did. God had a real issue with it. Even though the men were provoking it, letting it happen, they don't care. They didn't care about the daughters of Israel in covenant. All they cared about was building themselves up, and over time, it gained momentum over and over through the generations. We see it, and it has not changed. It has not changed. Um, then say they, because here we see Naboth's land being took. Then say to him, "This is what the Lord say: In the place where the dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up." your blood as well. So they ain't got it, but we know that Ahab dies, they do so lick up uh, his blood, Jezebel's blood gets licked up, and Jehu said to uh, pick him up and throw him in the field of Naboth. Um, they're not giving it to me. So let's go into the full passage here, the full chapter, and see if we can't find um, the Jezebel. Uh, who's bound to Baal, that's husband as lord and master. She's not a feminist, not unless you want to look at feminists as taking, um, you know, uh, the sides of um, the Baal men. Uh, you want to look at that as a feminist, then I guess that's a feminist. Um, let me see here. Naboth. Uh, Jezebel's plot was she plotted for her husband to build her husband up. So she was all part of the building up of the idol. You understand that's what it's saying. Um, she was not a feminist. No one sees me. She says, I will never be widowless. I will never be childless. Uh, but here we get a glimpse of her before she completely disappears from view as a harlot bound to a religious lie and idol, which she helped to build up. Um... 
Okay. So we'll begin in 21. Behold, I bring evil upon thee, and will take away the posterity. This is 1 Kings 21. And I will cut off from Ahab him that pisses against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and also she who built thee up and bowed to Baal as Lord and God. That's what it really should say, because that's what it testifies to that she was doing. Verse 22, And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Eat, you see? Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field, shall the fowls of the air eat. Why? Why? Because of the idol of Baal, which began as a calf out of Egypt. A gold calf that they made. And they built an idol standing of a man, Baal, husband, Lord, and God. And don't tell me this isn't the dream that Nebuchadnezzar bore witness to. And in the end, we smash the toes on that vault's image of of an idol, a man standing, and they give, oh, it speaks like a drag, like a lamb, <coughs> but it's a dragon, or actually it has the, the horns of a lamb, <coughs> but speaks like a dragon, and it says they give power to the idol to live and breathe, and they do, they do, the liars who bow down to Baal, a religious lie, and idol Jesus as Lord, and God, and Master, and the Spirit of everything, um, that's an idol, and you'll not be saved under an idol. And this all testifies, and that's why God says, present your case, defend yourself. The men accuse you daily, and you let them do it. You let them get away with you, because you can't be bothered to go in and study. And by the way, they're telling you, don't go study, just have faith. Besides, you won't understand it, because you're just a woman. Why do you think Baal organized it so that all men was empowered to stand on the pulpit Preach what they wanted to preach, no matter how negative against women. And you were told to remain silent. Why? So you could not defend yourself or your cause. And that is why God says in Isaiah 44, Thus saith the Lord, the Queen and the Redeemer of Israel, the Lord of hosts of the children, they belong to me. Um, I am the first and I am the last and there is no God but me who then is like me. Let her declare her case, her cause, controversy of Zion. Let her de declare her case. Declare it. <coughs> What's your case? It's the controversy of Zion, who they chose to exalt in their heart so they could debase womankind under them. So, let her declare her case before me since I established an ancient people that was the daughters of Israel. Let her foretell the things to come and what is to take place. Do not tremble or fear. Have I not told you and declared it long ago? You are my witnesses. You are my servant, O daughter of Israel. Is there any God but me? There is none that I know of, she says. There is no other rock. I know not one. Psalm 74, 22. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember the insults. The, the men and the fools that bring against you daily. Isaiah 63, she then calls her forth. Then she remembered the days of old of Moses and her people saying, Where is she that brought them through the sea? With the shepherd of her flock, where is she who set her Holy Spirit among them? That is the presence of God standing. The camp of Mahanaim. And you see her with the Shulamite. Pick up your head. Open your eyes. Stop bowing to a religious idol. Verse 12. She sent her glorious right arm. Know thee not thine own right hand can save thee. To be at Moses' right hand, dividing the waters. She did this before uh, to obtain eternal fame. That takes us to the daughters who bear this religious law like a burden upon them. And they will get fame and glory in every land where they were put to shame by the men of Baal. That began as a bull out of Egypt. And the witnesses then die in a place of Sodom in Egypt. That's why. So there's our study on Jeroboam and why the study was so important. It should have been done three or four years ago. But um, 
So we see the poison from generation to generation is what we see. And um, that's why it says, who can declare to me what took place from the beginning to the end. And she's saying, um, I give the scepter to the one to whom it belongs to, to the one that can be bothered to go in and search for the truth. You will be the ones that will have the scepters. You will. And there's real power in that. You're going to be able to part waters with that scepter upon you. Now, we don't see it taking place right here, right now. And it might. I believe it's definitely going to take part, place in the spirit world. Or is taking place. And um, we're just not allowed to know it or see it. So anyway, uh, there's our study on Jeroboam. Wow, was it worth it. It was so worth it. I got to see so much and uh, understand so much. And um, that's what happens when you don't listen to the Spirit. When you should, at the time you should. So thanks for watching. I pray the Lord blesses you with an abundance of truth. And um, I hope you all have a really nice day. And thanks for watching.